Good evening and welcome to the Edinburgh International Conference Centre. My name is Gail McGuinn and I am Head of Association Sales at the EICC. I am delighted to welcome you all here tonight to EICC Live, our series of free and public talks. Just a little housekeeping to get out of the way to start with. There is no fa planned fire alarms this evening, so if you, the alarm does sound, please follow the signs and exit the building as quickly as possible. And just for everyone's information, we are filming this evening. For those of you on social media, I would encourage you all to share your thoughts and post using the hashtag EICCLive, and hopefully the conversation can continue after this evening. EICC Live is part of the EICC's commitment to community engagement, bringing people together to educate and inspire. All the things that our thousands of conference delegates experience here at the EICC every year. Since its launch in 2019, the EICC Live has hosted talks on a wide range of areas, including the future of healthcare, women in technology, sport endurance, banking and neurodiversity, to name a few. In association with the Edinburgh Climate Compact and the Edinburgh Climate Commission, tonight's theme is Collaborating for Climate Action, where you'll hear about how we can all play our part to make Edinburgh both a greener and healthier city. This evening we will hear talks from Jamie Brogan, Head of Climate Partnership at the Edinburgh Climate Change Institute and Chair of the Edinburgh Climate Commission. Claire Foster, Partner and Head of Clean Energy at Shepherd and Wedderburn, Claire will also chair the Q&A at the end of the talks. And Aaron McQueen, a Sustainability Manager at Edinburgh Airport. And finally, Dr Anita Ogilvie, Executive Strategy Manager at Edinburgh Napier University. So to begin tonight's proceedings, I would like to welcome Jamie onto the stage. Thank you, Jamie. A talk is a very grand way of describing what I'm going to do. I'm just going to give you some quick reflections, I think, on where I think we are on taking climate action at the moment. And this, you know, I'd reflect this globally and locally. We're seeing a lot of ambition, a lot of targets, a lot of commitments, a lot of strategies, um, a lot of blah, 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 people might say, um, a lot of rhetoric. Um, but what we're not seeing enough of in my opinion, is this. You know, we need to get to where companies and where people are identifying their priorities, they're recognizing opportunities, and they're delivering both climate benefits in terms of emissions reduction, return on investment for businesses, because there is return on investment for businesses from taking climate action, and all of the economic, social, and communi community benefits that we know we can realize by a more positive approach to climate. Part of the reason we're not seeing all of those is because it's complicated. Um, we need to embed climate into the decisions we all make uh, as, as people, as businesses. And we need to, it's a shared problem. You know, this, this requires us to work across organizational boundaries, um, to, to join up systems, to work in ways that we're, we're just not used to working uh, in, in the past. And that's complicated. So the, the three, hats that I wear, the three organizations that I represent today are all there to help with that. The, the Climate Commission, the Climate Change Institute, which is Scotland's center of expertise on climate change, and the Climate Compact, which I'm going to ask Claire onto the stage now to talk a little bit more about. So good evening everyone and thanks so much for making time to come along to hear about the Edinburgh Climate Compact. My name is Claire Foster, I'm a partner in the banking team at Shepherd and Wedderburn which is one of the uh, law firms in Edinburgh, we're headquartered here. Um, and I led the team who originally developed the Edinburgh Climate Compact so that's why I'm standing here. But I should mention that my day job is also head of clean energy at Shepherd and Wedderburn, so I manage a team of 90 lawyers across our business and managed to persuade our board to sign up to the Edinburgh Climate Compact. So it's a very broad church and all sorts of organisations have signed up. So the question that I'm asked and a number of uh, people who are involved with the compact um, on a fairly regular basis is what is the Edinburgh Climate Compact? So I think it's worthwhile starting at the beginning and giving you some context. 
So why did we want to create a compact? What do we mean by that? And there were a number of reasons behind it. Taking a step back a few years, in 2019, Scotland declared a climate emergency, and shortly thereafter, Edinburgh also declared a climate emergency, along with a real ambition to reach net zero by 2030. Bear in mind that's a hugely ambitious target, enormous in fact, particularly when you look at Edinburgh and some of the key issues that we're facing in the city in terms of heat and transport. Now, the Scottish legislative target is net zero by 2045, so we have a challenge on our hands. So this was a work stream that I was asked to lead on behalf of the Edinburgh Climate Commission at the end of September 2020. I'm still trying to work out why I was asked to do that. I don't know whether it was because I was belligerent or worked with words every day, or if you give me a target, I'll generally try and go for it. And we officially launched the week before Christmas. So from September to December, I had a group of very focused commissioners who worked with me to try and draft this thing. And that Christmas launch, which bear in mind was during lockdown, was done on Teams a few days before Christmas. And I had six organizations who signed up as our first city climate champions. And I made them sign a document called the Edinburgh Climate Compact. What we wanted to create in the background to the compact was we wanted a platform to allow businesses and organizations, public sector, private sector, and the third sector to come together, to commit to taking certain actions to tackle climate change, to share best practice, and so provide a unique opportunity for Scotland's capital to show the world the power that teamwork has in addressing the climate emergency. Now, bear in mind the timing of this. It was all around COP26. And of course, Edinburgh, as the capital city, was determined to make a splash. And we wanted something tangible that organizations could sign up to as evidence of their commitment. So you hear lots of people saying, I'm very committed to climate change. But actually, physically signing a document saying, I commit to do a number of things was quite powerful. And that tangible nature was not only on the day they signed, but a commitment to com continue to commit to that on an ongoing basis. So it's a document that's been signed by a number of organizations and sets out the commitments being made. Now, underpinning all of this is the desire to help facilitate a green recovery. I don't know if a number of you are familiar with that expression. It was coined by Boris Johnson a number of years ago with his 10-point plan for uh, a green recovery and an economic revolution. Fundamentally, it's a win-win in terms of decarbonisation, but also helping to get the economy back on track in a sustainable way. Now, when you think back to 2007, 2008, when the wheels came off, a lot of people piled into carbon-intensive industries to try and get the economy moving again. We knew this time round that couldn't be the case. And so when you look at things like Scotland and all of the activity that's going on in the clean energy sector, people are investing in clean tech, better technologies, things that are going to be more sustainable. What better way to achieve that through collaboration, particularly across the city and across sectors? So we made a great start at the launch in December with representatives from a number of sectors deliberately chosen. And those were sectors whom we directly approached based on their presence in the city, whether they were large emitters, large employers, or those with a large building footprint across the capital. And we targeted sectors such as public sector, the council, construction sector, financial sector, power sector, transport, and the health and emergency services and education. And what was remarkable, think back to COVID, when we were in the midst of it, how difficult life was. What was remarkable about these organizations and these sectors was the reaction to the compact. Universally positive, universally enthusiastic. And the original group of six climate champions, as we called them, comprised NatWest, slash Royal Bank of Scotland, I have to get that in, Robertson Group, the University of Edinburgh, City of Edinburgh Council, NHS Lothian, and the Edinburgh Fringe and Festival Society, a really diverse bunch. 
each with their own climate challenges. But what was remarkable about the launch meeting was the palpable enthusiasm about making a change and making a difference. You can't bottle that. It's quite remarkable when you get people sitting on a Teams call going, I feel really passionate about this. But the compact isn't just about large organisations. Some of the names I've mentioned may make you think, actually, this isn't for me. It is. We've worked really hard to engage with the SME community and ensure that membership is broad and varied. So if you go onto the Edinburgh Climate Commission website, there's signposting for people who are just starting on their sustainability journey. And it's not dictated by size. So for me, I loved it because it was the first time in Scotland that a commitment like this had been agreed publicly. But since then, we're delighted to see that it's been used as a baseline for action in other cities, most notably Glasgow, our friends in the West. And Glasgow now has its own green economy hub charter. And since launch, we've organized a number of climate compact meetings, each hosted by a different city climate champion, a lot of them online actually, but it works. And where the host will share some of the changes they've made within their organization and the progress achieved as a consequence of that change, and also sharing some of the challenges. And the challenges are different for every organization. Now I think, and if you speak to a number of the signatories to the compact, I think they'll agree, these meetings can be enormously helpful because they allow information sharing. More often than not, when an organization encounters a roadblock, someone else will have faced the same challenge and can help find a way through and make suggestions about how best to move things forward. And how many members do we now have from that original six? We're at 25. It's not bad going when you look at some of the names up there. And we're in discussions with a number of others who are trying to get to the position where they're ready to sign up. And they have one common goal, trying to make a difference in the fight against climate change. So what does joining the compact entail? Organizations are asked to make a series of decarbonization commitments and sign the Edinburgh Climate Compact document. And they're split into four categories, and each is intended to support Edinburgh's ambition to reach net zero by 2030. Now, the impact of these categories will vary from organization to organization, and they were deliberately formulated on the basis that they need to be set at a particular level that allowed and encouraged organizations to sign up. We're not expecting everybody to buy a fleet of electric vehicles. We're not asking everybody to immediately ditch all their subcontracts if their subcontractors aren't 100% carbon neutral. But we're asking you to think about it. We're asking you to do the analysis. We're asking you if you could change a few things, will it make a difference? And I guess as a result of signing the compact, it means these city climate champions are publicly committing to undertake ambitious action in various areas, helping Edinburgh, which is important to all of us, move forward faster, but together on its decarbonisation journey. So what's my ask of you this evening? You've made the effort to come here. We've given you some wine, which always helps. It's very simple. My hope is that we will convince you this evening to see the benefits of the compact. And we'll maybe go onto the website to try and find out a bit more. And if we've piqued your interest enough, maybe go back to your organizations and say, hey, have you heard about the Edinburgh Climate Compact? It might be worth signing up to that. We're confident that the actions of the champions will inspire businesses and employers across the city to follow suit and join the compact to make the changes we do so desperately need to see. We're not going fast enough at the moment. And when you look at the diverse range of people who have signed up to the compact, we're all from different backgrounds, we're all from different disciplines, but we can all bring something that adds value. And with that, I'm going to stop talking. I'm doing the whole hearts and minds thing again. I can't help myself sometimes. Uh, I'm going to hand over to two of our climate champions to hear more about their experience of the compact and the benefits. And then we'll open it up to the floor for you guys to ask us some questions, which we'd be delighted to take. Thank you for your attention. Well, good evening. 
So, delighted to be back in the amazing EICC and to share my stage with uh, fellow Compact members and climate champions. And thanks very much for the opportunity. It's always an absolute pleasure. Unfortunately, I've got to start with a, a small apology. Gordon Robertson, our Director of Communications and Sustainability, was unable to attend tonight. So you've got the pound shop version instead. So bear with me. So my name is Aaron McKean. I am the new Sustainability Manager at Edinburgh Airport. And it's my role to pay specific, specific attention to the S part of our ESG offering. So I'm very much involved in our community engagement efforts, our uh, charity activations, and of course, delivering across our greater good sustainability strategy. And it's that which I wish to discuss tonight. Now, I don't have long, so I'd like to talk you through greater good, what's been going on, in 20, what we can look forward to in 2023, and to talk a little bit about the Climate Compact more broadly and, uh, and some of the experiences we've had with it. So, bear with me. Now, launched during the height of the pandemic in 2021, our Greater Good strategy aims to address our environmental, societal and economic impacts through its four pillars. The four pillars give us a, a framework from which to ex plan, execute and then measure all of our activity. And using this four pillar system, we can aim to lead, inspire and support others on their journey to net zero and to hopefully lead to a more sustainable future for Scotland and all those that wish to live in, work in and to visit. Now we can see from the logo kind of what we're going for here, the four quadrants all slightly overlapping, showing that actually sustainability requires a, a multi-pronged approach to create true impact. Now with this in mind, I'm just going to delve straight into our first pillar. So first one, Scotland's best business. And this essentially highlights our commitment to acting with integrity um, for our people, our passengers, and our partners. Now, I'll just go over a few quick highlights for 2023, what to look forward to. First and foremost, really excitingly, is uh, our launch of our diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI program, with a, a great company called Work180. Uh, and they aim to review our employer offering uh, with, a, with, a, with a main focus on gender diversity, LGBTQI+. We also have a, a capital project reviewing our accessibility options for site and staff and passengers uh, and making sure that this is an open and accessible environment for all. Furthermore, we're uh, ex further expanding our young person outreach and look forward to delivering even more STEM sessions with our uh, engineering tomorrow. And we're also looking to further partner with our local schools and universities to hopefully deliver more projects, placements, internships and things like that in the year ahead. Moving on swiftly, Enhancing Scotland. So Enhancing Scotland signals our sincere intention to be a positive for the country in terms of business, its biosphere, and customer experience, of course. This year, we can look forward to just about 500,000, half a million in a waste improvement project to, to further um, bolster our recycling and, of course, material recovery, which is a, which is a large, large impact for us. Already, 100% of our waste is diverted from landfill, but of course, there's always improvements and efficiencies that we can made there. We're also looking at, of course, as many people I'm sure in this room are, uh, a deposit return scheme readiness, uh, August 16th this year, which I'm sure a lot of people are going to be spending a lot of time on in the months ahead. So we will actually be a voluntary, uh, a voluntary return point. So again, lots of, uh, lots of activity there. And perhaps most excitingly for me is our biodiversity strategy, our first ever biodiversity strategy being launched this year alongside a wildflower meadow around the periphery of the airport. And Trusted Neighbour is one of the pillars I deal with most closely. And essentially, this is about sharing our success with our local community, um, and especially those that are most impacted by the activity of the airport. So we've invested heavily in noise monitoring equipment, with even more noise monitors being implemented around our local area. Uh, the next one is actually going to be placed in Cramond, Cramond Primary School, with another potentially going in the Dalmeny Estate. And this helps us monitor the impact, the noise that people are experiencing in these areas, and to, make, to understand that and to really have the data to take action if required. We've also got a £20 million water infrastructure investment into improving the quality of our circus, surface water discharge, and that's to ensure that the passenger experience is maintained, but also there's no, well, we limit any chances of runoff into local bodies of water, which is hugely important for us. 
Of course, there's a continuation of our two-year charity partnership with a, a, an organization called The Larder, who's based out in Livingston. They're fantastic people, and they deal with essentially upskilling young people from diverse and sometimes quite deprived backgrounds and getting them ready for the world of work. And very current, because it's probably going live in the next fortnight or two, um, got up to £140,000 being allocated via our community fund. Um, now, this money is often used for small projects from charities, community, uh, community groups and social enterprises on any sort of project that aligns with our four pillars. And of course, zero carbon. I don't think this needs much introduction. A lot going on this year. 2023 is going to be a really exciting year for us. First and foremost, we've got a 5.8 megawatt solar farm. that will be at the west end of the, 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 the runway, if you can imagine that. And that will take up to 11 acres. So with the, when this is up and running, this will be around about 25% of the campus's energy demand supplied through that on a, on a good day. And of course, when it's not required, it can be sold back into the grid. So hugely exciting, and, and what an impact that makes as a visitor to Edinburgh or someone leaving Edinburgh seeing this massive solar panel site. Another uh, really innovative program we've got going on is with a, a company called Catrick Technologies. Now, we're utilising non-rotating turbines to harness any turbulent air around the airfield, and that's then turned into electricity. So that's another really exciting trial going on just now. We've also got the development of a district heat network um, business case just now in partnership with the Scottish Government, so more to come on that, I'm sure. And, of course, the implementation of a revised net zero roadmap, which was developed throughout 2022, leading to Edinburgh Airport being net zero for scope one and two by 2030. And now I'd just like to talk a little bit about the climate compact more broadly. You know, as the local saying goes, Edinburgh is a village, and it, tr it truly is, as has been highlighted tonight, I think. Um, the airport's much the same. Dozens of organisations all working in tandem to create as seamless a travel experience as possible for our passengers. And it's with this attitude of neighbourly collaboration that we partake in the Climate Compact. We see these kinds of partnerships as an absolute key part of our sustainability strategy. Another benefit of the Compact has been learning of the challenges and solutions faced by other industries and other businesses. We've had some incredible talks last year by the, from the likes of NHS Lothian, uh, SPEN, the City of Edinburgh Council. Um, so it's been such a valuable learning experience for all of us, I think. And i just finish by saying that I think the Climate Compact is about commitment and accountability. Membership of the Compact demonstrates our drive as an airport to help in achieving Edinburgh's ambitious targets and in joining in solidarity with our city partners to do so. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to hand over to Anita from the Edinburgh Napier. Well, thank you very much, Aaron, and thank you, Claire and Jamie, and, and thank you for coming here tonight. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. My name is Anita Ogilvy. I'm here representing Edinburgh Napier University, and my role is director, is executive manager of strategy. And, and this really sort of is because, well, the reason I'm here tonight is because just how pivotal that sustainability is within our strategy. So um, I'm delighted to share a bit about our sustainability journey, um, about um, our place in Edinburgh, and particularly about why we think the Edinburgh Climate Compact is so important. So first of all, a bit about us for those who don't know who we are. So um, I'll get plug in first of all, we're top modern um, university in Scotland. Um, we are rooted in Edinburgh, as, as you know, um, but we have a wide international reach. Um, and we really consider ourselves a home of difference makers. And we make that difference through our learning and teaching, through our research, and through a really diverse uh, community of staff, students and partners. Um, and, um, and just to give you a bit of scale to that, so we've got about 1,800 members of staff, we've got about 21,000 students of which are from about 140 countries, 71% of which study with us here in Edinburgh, uh, about, and about 44% of them are international students. So we really do recognise our role in contributing to the diverse nature of the city of Edinburgh. Um, but also the fact that, that that diversity comes with um, a climate cost, so we're very well aware of that. Um, in terms of our provision, it's very broad. We have, we're a very applied university. You'll see the different subject areas that we, that we cover. Um, but because of our scale, we're able to really lean into interdisciplinarity. And I think when you're dealing with grand challenges like climate change, that's, that's really sort of critical aspect. 
Um, in terms of our campuses within Edinburgh, we, we, we're, we're split across three campuses at the moment, um, and as well as some student accommodation within and around the city centre. Um, so you'll see from, th from that there, we've got Site Hill, Craig Lockett and Merkiston. So quite different buildings um, uh, with, with their own operational challenges, um, but also access to some really different communities that we really like to sort of engage with and we recognise the ability to do more there. Um, and in fact, we're disembarking on a big project to look at our infrastructure and estates at the moment. And the, the top design principle within that focus is about delivering our sustainability um, commitments. Um, so, so that's really, um, this is where we'll kind of talk next about what those commitments are. So I'm here talking about um, our, our strategy because um, we, we had a, so we've actually got a long track record within the University of, um, of, of, client, of carbon reduction, but also of um, sort of grassroots programmes and, and, and sustainability teaching. And in fact, I'm speaking to a colleague Professor Tariq Munir just before I came in here and he was giving me a load of firsts that I wasn't even aware of. We were apparently the first um, university to, to install free electric vehicle charging a number of years ago. Um, so we have a long track record, but what we recognised is that when we decided to revisit our entire university strategy just a couple of years ago um, and thinking really about our purpose, our DNA, and um, our responsibility as a university, um, but, um, but also listening to the voice of our staff and students, it was really clear that sustain environmental sustainability needed to be really in there, sort of front and centre, and make some really progressive commitments within that. On the back of that, we developed, sort of fleshed that out through our environmental sustainability strategy, which you can find on our web pages. Um, and I'll just talk very briefly about the sort of dimensions of that. So, first of all, we see a huge opportunity and responsibility for us in the sort of academic and research commitments. So we see our, our kind of through our curriculum and um, we've got an, a massive um, opportunity for our graduates to leave the university and go into employability which is a big focus for us and really be having learned or ha having studied with through their discipline with a lens of sustainability they can go into the workplace and really influence the, the sort of professional practices of the future and also focusing on green skills but within our kind of curriculum development framework sustainability a core theme there so all our programs have to look at the impact of sustainability on that discipline whether it be in arts and creative industries whether it be health and social care whether it be engineering um, we've also got interdisciplinary modules which allow students to come together and work out on sustainability problems and in fact we've just adopted some new um, some, some new operational practices on the back of students recommending um, those very things to us which is great and research, I don't have the time at all to talk about the sort of the breadth of the research and or any projects that we've got involved, but we do have a plethora of research groups, research um, uh, sort of centres, institutes, focusing across sustainable construction, renewables, sustainable tourism, conservation, business for good, a whole a smart, smart cities, etc. So we recognise again that what a university can do like us in, in terms of applying that research into the sort of both the, the sort of the grand challenge of climate change, but where we can feed more locally into what the problems that the, the city is trying to overcome. So through our innovation hub, through our knowledge exchange, we've got a real responsibility to drive and support that. And we have a overarching academic theme, which is around about well-being and sustainability. And we're recently shortlisted as University of the Year because of the way that that was embedded, not only through our academic um, sphere, but also embedding it through our operations. So we know we're making some progress, even though we've got a way to go. Now, in terms of our operations, we've talked about carbon already. So carbon, we're not all about carbon, but carbon is, you can't get away from carbon when you're talking about um, sustainability. Like, like the city, we have made a commitment to be uh, net zero by 2030 at the latest. Um, and that's within our kind of operations. But we've also committed to um, reducing our, uh, minimising our emissions around our wider influence and also our legacy carbon, which we think is quite distinctive. Now, what does that mean again in practice? So in terms of our scope, that's our, our, big, our big hitters really for, for our carbon emissions are gas, electricity and business travel. We also look at obviously waste, water and F gases, but those are the three big areas. And pre-pandemic, we were sitting about six and a half thousand tonnes of CO2 equivalent emissions within those areas, probably about a third each actually gas, electricity and travel. Now that's probably halved since then. Some of that is planned reduction through, um, through, through changes in terms of the way we um, practices around electricity. Um, uh, gas has stayed actually roughly the same and that's a huge area for us to sort of look at in terms of our decarbonisation. And it's an area that we really think the Edinburgh Climate Compact and the opportunity to work with others there can really help. Um, business travel, it's, um, 
it has obviously fallen off the cliff a little bit with them um, with with the pandemic but it's coming back in and it will need to come back and it will increase because we are an international university we recognize the value of the diversity of our students and our staff they need to be traveling to take part in research and connect with others and, and global mobility is really important but we also absolutely recognize the cost of the, the climate cost of that so part of it is about making sure we make really good decisions about when that travel is appropriate and also part of our strategy is recognizing that both to deal with travel which will be there in some shape or form uh, until we find better ways of, of traveling um, but also our commitment to legacy carbon we've also made a commitment to ethical carbon offset within our strategy and we've got some good academic expertise in that area so confident that we can make some good decisions there and the final area really there and uh, final dimension really about that wider uh, impact around about the united nations sustainable development goals and we've made commitments to demonstrate our impact against those and the scottish national performance framework and in fact i think i was speaking to a colleague just yesterday who's here miles about one of the challenges we have is actually just being able to mine our data really well to make sure we understand understand where we're making a big difference and when we need to work harder um, and so 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 that's kind of part of our focus at the moment is to make sure that we're working not only through our curriculum and our, our research and our operations but getting out and working with the community to make sure we're making an impact across this these important areas so we reckon we're doing we're we're getting there we do, we're doing quite well we've had a recent sort of um uh, audit through um, People and Planet, they, they look at your public data, so when we do report our carbon emissions everything through, we've got a, a mandate to do that through public bodies reporting against Scottish Government definitions, so the information's all out there. We've had some really good results, but that's through one lens, and we recognise that even though we've got some really good expertise to share, we have got a long way to go, and we need to learn with others. And that probably takes me on to really the next area, which is the collab uh, sort of collaboration and working together with others. It's really part of Edinburgh Napier's MO, we are, um, we're all about um, the ethos of working together. We realise that if we're really going to be the home of difference makers, we, are, we, we need to work with others to do that. You have a much greater impact. Now, I'm not going to be able to talk through the projects that I've, I've, I've highlighted there. I've just put a few pictures there sort of about where we collaborate on things like period poverty, um, lab plastics recycling, um, our Lionsgate permaculture and digital design, that's local to our Murchison campus, working to give young people a voice through COP26, or, or collaborations out in sort of Kenya looking at um, community-led um, mangrove conservation funded through the sale of carbon credits. We've got a massive range of, of different um, collaborations we take part in, but what we wanted to bring up, talk about here, obviously, is the Edinburgh Climate Compact. And we recognise, really, that the opportunities that they, that brings from a place-based perspective. We want to sign up because it was really purposeful, it was really tangible. The, the commitments were very much aligned with our direction of travel, but, but knowing that there are huge opportunities both through our operations and our estates to work together with others. Now, that could be about opening up our estates more for the community, working with others to share estates, working with experts around, um, around the, the compact to learn from them and how we can um, come out of gas. I mean, one of the things we'll talk about perhaps in the panel discussion is looking at things like district heating and looking at that in partnership. We've got established partners that the university already works with, like NHS, Lothian, Edinburgh College um, and the City of Edinburgh Council. But we've been able to open up to other, co other partners and, and colleagues through the compact, which has given us a bit of a catalyst and a bit of pace around some of these projects. Um, EV infrastructure, active travel, these are all areas that we recognise we've got a, a big opportunity to, to work with within the city. And the compact has really, as Aaron said, it's, it's been such a, 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 a kind of great forum to learn and experience what others are doing, to connect networks. So, and Miles, who I mentioned before here, he's part of the founding, founder of kind of Everyone's Edinburgh. So there's networks that we have and we've got access to that we can connect the, the, the compact to learn from others, and hopefully, as Jamie indicated, get on with some real action around about um, our climate targets and initiatives. So I'll, um, I'll probably stop there because I know that there's wanted to have time for Q&A, but we've got, there's a website there. Please look, uh, we, we put a lot on our website, and if you have any questions, um, do get in touch. Jamie, and my, this, is a, this is quite a poignant picture because we were at, um, uh, this is where we're at COP26, we actually got approval from our university leadership team on the phone that our sustainability strategy being approved. And I was actually also at the same time writing my blurb for having signed up to the compact so that um, we could put it on the website. So there, there is relevance to that picture. Jamie, I think, is here. He's our environmental sustainability manager, so he really knows what he's talking about. But I've been um, delighted to be invited here today. So thank you. Thanks, Anita, and thanks to Aaron and Jamie as well for 
for what I found captivating speeches. We're now going to throw it open to the floor. Um, I will give you a few moments to collect your thoughts. I think there's going to be a roving mic. So if you do have a question, please pop your hand up and make sure the microphone comes to you. Um, but as chair, I'm going to take liberties and ask the first question, because that's what I normally do. So I'll apologize in advance. Um, Anita, one question for you. Uh -huh. Why do you think the compact is different? Because there's a myriad of other initiatives going on across the UK that you could sign up to. Why do you think this is different? Yeah, that's a really pertinent question, actually. We had, um, we actually thought long and hard, well, not, not thought long and hard about signing it. We actually had to make quite a case to sign up to the compact because we, there is, we're inundated all the time with accords, compacts, commitments to this and that and they, and when you sign up to so many without necessarily really thinking about them they can become a bit meaningless and yeah. um, when we didn't want it to be a tick box exercise um, first of all we recognised the alignment with what we were trying to achieve um, so nothing within what was in the compact was something that we weren't trying to deliver um, I think the reason we thought it would be really important for us to do is because it is purposeful and it's place based and the fact that those two things come together with a common goal means you really can work together with others to try that. So we know that collaboration and working across organisations, as Jamie said, isn't easy, but when you have a footing like that, that brings people into, the, into a forum with the same goal, you can get access to the right sorts of people, you can get support, and actually the collegiality piece as well. Working in higher education, we really benefit from being quite open doors to each other, but that's not always the same when you start to work into a commercial organisation or, or just get access to other businesses. So for us, the compact gave us a kind of something that was really based on a, on a place and a, and a shared ambition. So we thought it was worthwhile. It's not let us down, really, really benefited so far. Good to hear. Aaron, do you want to add to that before I go to the floor? Well, I think you covered a lot there. Absolutely, the place-based aspect is so important, I feel, uh, for a really impactful uh, um, climate reduction strategy. And, it, and I think, frankly, again, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. Edinburgh is a village, and we, we all bump into each other all the time. And when Edinburgh gets rolling, we really do work so well together. So I think extrapolating that into action for the climate I think uh, only good things can come from that. So yeah, it's a really powerful initiative. It's a really great opportunity to meet local people working in the same sphere across different businesses. So I think it's, uh, it's incredibly worthwhile for organizations to get signed up. Thank you. I'm not gonna ask you, Jamie, because you know why it's <laughs> worthwhile. Uh, the, the gentleman with his hand up, sorry, I'm gonna, oh, sorry, the nearest one, lady in red, sorry. <laughs> um, it's been very interesting to hear what's happening in Edinburgh, and I'm really encouraged by that. Um, it's probably a question for you, Claire. Um, we live in a, a development in Edinburgh with 78 properties. Um, we have 56 spaces, which we have recently managed to get grant funding for infrastructure uh, to put in EV charging points. So we've got the grant funding there for those um, the, the, the different bays. Um, but that was done because one of our people on our steering group well, had an EV. And he basically charged that forward and we as a group took that forward and we're now getting the infrastructure put in place with grant funding, which means it would have cost around about £580 per owner. It's now going to cost £74 per owner to get the infrastructure in place. It strikes me that there are lots and lots of developments across Edinburgh. Um, with lots and lots of different property development managers. So because we did it ground up, is there an opportunity for Climate Compact to get in touch with the various property development managers and try and encourage them to do it, um, to, to do all the groundwork? We did all the groundwork to make it happen, um, but it would be good to think that across Edinburgh, property managers could actually be telling people that this exists and you only need one person with one electronic vehicle to be able to apply for this funding. Mm -hmm. So that's just my question. It's a great example of what can be achieved, uh, the collective power of the residents to try and do something. And it's, it's analogous to what we're doing within the compact. You know, we're probably at a slightly different scale with some of the projects we're trying to get off the ground, but that doesn't take away from what you've described. I would love to see social landlords, private landlords, actually looking at their estate and going, what can I do to help the residents? And for me, I mean, one of the big challenges we've got in Edinburgh, we're a UNESCO heritage site. 
it's really difficult to decarbonise Edinburgh compared to some other cities. But those steps that you've taken are a brilliant example where it's not impacting on the fabric of the building, it's in the car parking area, but it's making a difference. It's taking diesel and petrol off the road and putting EVs there as well. I, I applaud you for your efforts. Any other questions? Yeah, um, uh, thank you to all of you this evening. Um, I was one of the small startups at uh, actually ECCI, Ideas Labs, uh, from 2016 to 2017. We, as a group in that lab, there were companies that was developing some amazing technologies at the time. And uh, these are all small startup businesses. I guess the question I have for uh, the panel here especially Aaron um, from Edinburgh Airport, is when you have small startup companies that has developed technologies that can actually help you as an organization in your journey towards net zero, how do you get access to what they have and what efforts do you actually make to look around locally to see if you can actually find solutions to some of the problems you are having at the moment. Thank you. Sure, Ben, that's a, a great question. Um, yeah, I, I think as an airport, again, we're, we're used to working in collaboration and we do need to have some novel solutions to some of the challenges the, the industry faces. So again, going back to, to the presentation, working with with some smaller organizations working on quite novel solutions to, for instance, creating wind energy and, and trialing that is, is really important to what we're doing. But of course, we're always scanning the market for new opportunities and we're constantly approached by different organizations. Some are startups, some are a bit more uh, further along uh, in their journeys. So yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a case by case basis, I suppose. Um, and it depends on what the, the business is needing at the time what uh, the industry is needing and, and what we're needing to do to achieve our, our current goals, frankly. I know that's a bit of a wishy-washy answer, but um, I hope that answers some of it. I mean, what I would add to that, so I, I come from a finance background and I tend to act for the commercial banks or the large funds that are out there looking at deployment of clean tech. And it's really challenging for the people who come up with the bright idea that could change the world. Trying to commercialise that is incredibly challenging. But there are organisations out there, without wanting to give anybody a plug, I'm <laughs> going to pass on to Jamie, who can help you with that. But there are organisations who engage with startups on a regular basis and connect them with the money, whether it's angel investors, seed startup funds from high net worth individuals. You are not going to be able to get a brand new piece of kit to commercial scale and engage with someone like me who's looking to deploy senior debt of millions and millions of pounds, you have to start somewhere. And it's probably engaging with the likes of Jamie and others who can connect you with people to have those conversations. And as it grows and it builds, the audience becomes wider and wider and wider, and then you get to commercial deployment. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in our DNA at the university, as you know, to, to help to help businesses to collaborate with businesses. Sorry, I've done it again. I know you have. The, 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 <laughs> on, on developing that technology. Um, we're doing some work just now, actually, to understand the support landscape for uh, climate tech companies in Scotland, because, frankly, it is a little bit fragmented, and we're working with Scottish Enterprise to try and address that a little bit so that there's more support for companies. And we wish we were still running the ideas lab, but Brexit put, paid to all of that, I'm afraid, which is one of the many disbenefits of it. Sorry, I've, I've sworn twice in one answer there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yes, Hi. please. Hello. Um, it was a question um, for yourself, Anita. Um, you mentioned something about uh, teaching students green skills, and I was just curious if you could uh, expand a little bit on what you meant with that. Yeah, thanks. So there's a, there's a couple of angles to that. So one is really about making sure that the curriculum that we teach, whatever discipline that's in, in any school, has, has been developed with sustainability in mind. So what, is, what does it mean to be um, a freelancer in the arts and creative industries? 
to be able to do that from a, with, a, with a kind of green hat on or in, from an engineering point of view. So some of it is about taking core curriculum and, and making sure we sort of um, link that and understand what that, the implications are from sustainability and then take that into the workplace. There's other things which are about really recognising where the future jobs are and how we can upskill the kind of the community and that could be sort of uh, short courses for um, for actually people in, 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 in industry already who need to upskill and to sort of to, to green up in terms of where that industry is going. It could be for um, people who are looking for a career change. Um, and, and so part of that is looking at the landscape of where those jobs are needed, um, understanding and working around about the funding. Um, we, we certainly as a university, we have a lot of um, sort of upskilling programmes that are short courses that, that, are, that are funded by the Scottish Funding Council. Other ones we're looking to sort of try and develop um, in recognition of where those jobs are needed. And we certainly work in collaboration with college as well to try and understand that whole skills landscape. The, the government are looking at it, the Scottish Funding Council are, and as a university, it's definitely an area that we are kind of, have got in our sights and, and, and I mean, I've probably not given you a full enough answer to that, but it's, it's definitely on, on the agenda, big style for, for higher education. Jamie. Um, my colleague Claire and I, who's in the audience, actually have both found ourselves um, in the last couple of weeks in front of 2,000 school children online giving them careers advice, which is not a position I'd ever thought I'd find myself in. But, you know, when, when they're asking us about green jobs and green skills, every job in the future needs to be a green job. If we, if we don't embed this into the decisions everyone makes in every profession, then we're going to fail. And um, that, that's really, really important. The, the, the skills development Scotland definition is kind of, you know, there are new emerging sectors that require green skills that are, are coming along all the time. But there are a whole bunch of jobs. And as I say, I think it's every job that needs to transition in terms of understanding new technologies, embedding climate impact into your decision making, et cetera, et cetera. So every job is a green job. And just note that when you're going back to your jobs tomorrow morning. <laughs> Yes, uh, I am Emeritus, Emeritus Professor Tarek Munir. Uh, Anita mentioned my name in her presentation, uh, and she asked me to add to her uh, presentation. So what I have to say is Edinburgh Napier, along with other universities in the area, they've been very proactive. So back in 2005, I installed a 16 kilowatt solar PV module on the building, and it has a high visibility and it had a lot of returns. That was the largest project in 2005. But I'm happy to say things have moved on very rapidly. So now in Perthshire, we have a 13 megawatt project, and many more projects are coming through. Very happy to see what Edinburgh Airport is doing. But the, if you work with universities, it's a good idea, because they've got public buildings on which the technology can be demonstrated. And a lot of pe for a lot of people, seeing is believing. The universities also do a lot of research and dissemination through articles and so on. So the climate compact would be you know, well off working with all the universities in the area. They have means to publicize, disseminate information, and also test the validity of claims, as we have done. So we, have, we had the first electric charging station in 2012. We installed that at Edinburgh Napier. We had the first micro wind turbine station. We tested for a, over a long period of time micro wind turbine and their suitability in urban climate. We had solar uh, PV facade. Then my colleague uh, Jamie Pearson from Napier, he installed further 36 kilowatt on Site Hill building. So there are so many activities I can talk about, but the the, the main message. I want to give is work closely with universities. They are very good disseminators, researchers, yeah. publicizing through public buildings. For example, the Edinburgh Airport uh, wind testing project, you said, that's very fascinating. Now, if that was demonstrated within the city, that would be also uh, very beneficial. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think it illustrates the point. The compact has got Napier, we've got Edinburgh University, we've got Edinburgh College there as well. And we're trying to crowd in as many tertiary education establishments as we can. They are a wealth of information and expertise. And bear in mind the background to the compact. It's about bringing people from different disciplines and different sectors and sharing that. I see my colleague Scott nodding here. I mean, we do see the university very much as a, as a living lab. And so the question you were asking actually earlier on, 
we're very much a place to experiment with and we have a little bit more license to try out new technologies and to prove that they can work. And I've, I've worked at both Napier and the University of Edinburgh actually and I know they both have that ethos very much at the heart of what they do. Hmm. And, and yeah, I'd add from an airport perspective that absolutely we're looking to collaborate even more closely with Edinburgh. We do so at the moment. That could be in the form of placements. It could be in the form of dissertation topics. Um, who knows? But this is exactly the forum we need to be in to start those conversations and start making those connections and bridging those gaps. So yeah, really exciting and delighted to hear. Thanks for sharing your experiences there. There were hands shooting up everywhere. <laughs> Okay, so I just wanted to ask actually about the tourism industry in Edinburgh because it's such a huge part of it with it being a world uh, <laughs> heritage site. So um, I liked what you said earlier um, from the Edinburgh airport doing the solar panels over the field so they can see it as they're flying in. But how are you using the compact, if at all, to um, how is that going to affect the tourism industry? Because that's, you know typically or I guess here has quite a lot of, um, sorry, I blinked out. No, no, <laughs> I was just trying to work out whether there was anyone here from Edinburgh at the Engine Festival Society. I don't think there is. There is actually, but is I'm not going to pick on him because okay. I, 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 I was talking to him. This Do you get morning. my general question now? <laughs> we'll answer that question. <laughs> uh, so when I think back to the early days of the compact, it was fascinating speaking to the people from the tourism sector because they were struggling. The festival was decimated. It didn't happen for a couple of years. But what was interesting were their plans about going ticketless, doing everything online, getting rid of all those flyers that littered the Royal Mile, uh, and just collaborating more. So they spent a lot of time listening to what was going on and saying, actually, how can we modify our business model to make it more sustainable. And they were doing that with um, accommodation in terms of the hotels and the Airbnb side of things and trying to make sure that they were aware of what was going on and that there was a whole online program, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think the world would be a poorer place if festivals weren't international. So that's not gonna stop overnight. You, yeah. you, you need all of that kind of cultural exchange. But um, festivals are not just a, a, an experience, they're not just fun, they're also an education, they're informative, they're influencers. And as, as you saw, one of the commitments of the compact was to use your influence. And that's what organizations like the festivals can probably do most. I mean, the best people to speak to that in this room are Hannah and her team from the Science Festival, actually. <laughs> they're not probably the sort of festival you're talking about. But yeah, they can do so much. And they can make conscious choices, actually, you know, about where they book people from, um, whether their performers are just coming for a single event or whether they're coming as part of a tour, all of which kind of makes more out of, you get more bang for your carbon buck, if you like. I know that's a kind of glib phrase to use, but there are things that you can do. But I don't, you know, you're not going to shut down international tourism and international events because you shouldn't. And, and just to briefly add, so sustainable tourism is a kind of key research area as well, with me, because it's, it's a, I mean, it is trying to make that whole industry more sustainable, so both with here in Edinburgh, but then looking more broadly about how how, how tourism works in a more sustainable way. As Jamie said, there's lots of lots of levers mm -hmm. um, you can do to try and manage the, the impacts, but, but get the gains. Conscious of time, we might have. Can I ask a question? I've got a bike, so I'm just going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> OK, <laughs> crack on. <laughs> yeah. um, I was just wondering if you could look into the future a little bit around energy and transport in the city. <laughs> If you looked five or 10 years into the future, how do you think that will have changed? And I don't mean the avia aviation side, I mean getting around the city. And what really interests me is when the heat networks come in, will we have nodes that will develop all at the same time, all across the city and then be joined together? Or do you take an area like Granton and Pilton, Spain. for example, Spain, where there's more modern housing? I know it's not completely modern, but it's not built in the 1750s or whatever. So do you take an area like that and start from there and then build out to your UNESCO World Heritage Site parts of the city? So you're speaking in my ear, that's not I, I, Well, I, I happen to <laughs> notice that our heat networks expert on the compact has a microphone in his hand. Hello there. As if by magic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good thinking. Um, so I'm Ben Carter, I work for Vattenfall, and Vattenfall is uh, essentially focused on decarbonising heat and we really want to help <clears throat> the city of Edinburgh decarbonize through large-scale heat networks. 
Um, and we're already engaged in, in, in building out a heat network actually in the southeast fringe of the city, uh, starting out at Miller Hill uh, to Shaw Fair and, and hopefully very much beyond. Um, the, the, the simple answer is yes, we generally try and find some place where there is a, a confluence of sufficient demand, sufficient low cost, low carbon heat supply and, and, the, and the other regulatory or, or, or whatever planning conditions that are amenable to that. There's something coming out then this year called the Local Heat and Energy Efficiency Strategy, which every council in Scotland has to develop and submit. And in that strategy, they have to make commitments to what areas will be heat networks, what areas must focus on energy efficiency, etc. And they have to put that to Scottish government and say, this is how we want to do it, and ultimately, this is how much money we want to spend. Does that help answer your question? <laughs> Rock and roll. So, um, you don't get a question now, by the way. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, listen, I'm not going to ask my... No, I do have one very specific question, but I've got a point first, and that is it is incumbent, of course, on every member of the Edinburgh Climate Compact to report on how they are going to decarbonize. And I think that's one of the things that certainly helped me sell it internally to Vattenfall because we are an enabler, right? Because we're gonna be investing in, in the technology to decarbonize heat and help. And the Edinburgh Climate Compact gives us a fantastic opportunity to talk to partners that are trying to do that. So happy times. Uh, and yeah, uh, watch this space, you never know. We might have a project to talk about relatively soon, you never know. Um, the question was... <laughs> oh, there's a question. <laughs> okay. I'll be here all night. Um, <laughs> the question is, what are the criteria for joining the compact and is everyone invited? So, the criteria are set out on the Edinburgh Climate Compact page on the website. Go have a look at it. Um, it does, at the moment, the, the expectation is we're looking for businesses and employers. So it's not aimed at citizens, individual level. I'm being very upfront about that. And that's because what we were trying to do, using Jamie's expression, was get the biggest uh, carbon bang for our buck. Go for the big guys, get them to decarbonise. We're going to make big leaps in progress rather than asking individuals to spend money or try and make a difference. But the commitments are on there. Um, everybody that has signed up has gone through that internal process. I was one of them. I mean, why would a law firm sign up to a compact document? And I stood in front of our board and I said, our biggest issues are travel, because our lawyers are going up and down to London all the time. We don't anymore. I got the travel policy changed. We're now traveling by train. And the, in the first instance, the expectation is that you will see if you can do a meeting by Teams or Zoom. It's thing, incremental change. It, as I said earlier, it's not about expecting businesses to go out and buy a fleet of Teslas. It really isn't. But I am asking you to look at your electricity bill and see if your suppliers using 100% renewable sources for their electricity generation. If they're not, swap. It's really easy to do. It's a couple of clicks on a website. It's that type of thing. It's about being conscious of the difference that you can make. We did unashamedly target large businesses for obvious reasons when we started, and, and they can actually drive change into, into small businesses as well. But um, as we grow the compact, we're going to be doing a little bit of work with uh, Liz and our team at the Chamber of Commerce, actually, to promote that to the SME community. And we do a lot of work, actually, with the, the Royal Bank of Scotland, with Kevin and his team, to support the SME community through this transition to a zero carbon economy. Because if, you know, we, if we don't manage that transition, businesses won't be successful in the future. They really need to support the shared effort, but also to prepare themselves for the change that's gonna come. Oh, there's hands. Yes, we're <laughs> over time, but I can't help myself, go on. Yeah, I've also got the mic as well, just following <laughs> a very good People example. People are grabbing it. <laughs> So I, I wanted to push you a bit on the very good question about SME um, innovation and its link into the climate contact, uh, compact, because 
Like the previous speaker, I'm an Edinburgh-based SME, also with a foot in the Western Isles as well. Um, we've got technology that could help all of the, the big organisations in the climate compact to decarbonise. And, and I would like to put a thank out to one of your organisations, Edinburgh International Festival, because they gave us our first opportunity to demonstrate our technology when we powered Anna Meredith and Damon Albarn's performances at their contemporary music venue a few years ago. But um, um, but could the compact not be more proactive about trying to reach out and create that mechanism by which SMEs like uh, my colleagues, like mine, and many others that are in Edinburgh that have got the technologies, we don't need to test it, it's ready to go, we need commercial opportunities to get it into the market and help us grow, help us create jobs in Edinburgh, the kind of green jobs that Jamie was talking about. Um, and that would be a real win-win for Edinburgh. And I think, again, something that, you know, I think Edinburgh Climate Compact is doing something quite unique, but that would be something in addition that you could do to really make a difference to the SME economy. It's not something we focused on, being absolutely candid with you, because we had a list of challenges this long to try and target first. I would love to be a forum for new technologies to collate them, but unfortunately I manage a team of 90 in my day job. And what I should say about the compact members is it's voluntary. None of us are paid for our time. I we are. No more than half an FTE, at, um, and but the impact that that could have within the Edinburgh SME community would be would and we are trying very significantly. And we are trying to do some of that pooling investment. I mean, Scott, for example, has put a proposal in. It's not in your SME innovation space. It's actually to in, co-invest in biodiversity across the city, which is a poor relation to everything else because it doesn't deliver a return on investment, you know. So there, there are opportunities for the, the compact there. What we have to be slightly careful is presenting ourselves as a marketplace. And what we, we also have to be slightly careful is, is if people are joining the, mem the, the compacts just to sell stuff, because that's not what it's about. It's about knowledge sharing. It's about sharing the, the journey. That's not to say there's not opportunities for us to do what you're, you're asking to do, particularly in the, in the universities, as I said yeah. before. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I would just echo that. I think that's. I think being, universities are good places to start start those conversations. But the compact is a good sort of audience, yes, if you like. Yes. Um, even as Jamie said, even if it's not a, a kind of easy end to suddenly um, bringing new technologies in, yeah. actually, because it is all about learning, and, and yeah. we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'll ask. Yeah. I'll yes. The mic as well. Okay. Um, Brutal question about you talked about. I agree with you about the um, you know the the minor switches, the um, change of habits. It's going to be a long road to do all of that. What about the big hammers? What about the um, the the complacency about things need to change faster? So wh what about naming and shaming? What about identifying the big bigger problems and the, and the bigger contributors towards these kind of issues? Who could have the power and the money to change things and set an example like you mentioned that disseminates down to SMEs and other businesses? That's one, but take the airport, for example. You know, you may still have a long way to go to completely decarbonize your footprint and just putting solar farms on without actually removing anything that you contribute towards uh, carbon emissions isn't in the eyes of um, maybe the layperson or, or the rest of the, the industries and businesses a good example. Have you, have you done a gap analysis and an investment strategy to actually genuinely decarbonize, for example, in your case, and set a really, really strong example and send a message like electrifying all of your um, support vehicles and service vehicles, hydrogen introduction, where are you losing heat and energy in the, bus in, in the entire complex, for example? What more can you do and how fast are you going to say you can do it, for example? That great, great question. There's, a, there's quite a lot to unpack there, but you know, I'd like to give that my best, uh, my best, my best go. Um, yeah, I had a great quote this week uh, on a webinar, and, and I thought it was really, it really rung true for me. And it was, you know, the era, the era of perfectionism in the corporate narrative is over. And I think the first step is just being a little bit vulnerable and saying, 
you know, from an organisational perspective, we don't have all the answers, frankly. And that, that's true for many, many industries, but certainly for aviation too. Um, what, what we can do is what we can do, and that's everything that's in our direct control, right? That's what we can immediately action. So for Edinburgh Airport, that's things like setting up the, the solar farm and getting that going. That, we're, we're the first airport in the UK to do so. Um, it's about exploring different opportunities such as you know, district heat networks. And, and of course, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it, we've got this bridging, uh, bridging technologies, HVO, which is a drop-in fuel, which is a large reduction in carbon emissions, looking to completely electrify in, in the future, installation of new uh, electric charging points for, for customers and for passengers using the, 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 the airport. So there's a huge amount going on. Um, we absolutely recognise that there's larger industry-wide issues that need to be addressed. Things like the Green Freeport is going to be a great catalyst for this, um, bringing more investment into the area. It's going to bring lots of new skills and lots of bright minds together. We'll have organisations like INEOS, for instance, are going to really uh, push forward on the hydrogen agenda as well. And in the meantime, for aviation fuel, you have things like SAFT as that sort of bridging technology before we're, we're quite there. So. The answer is, we don't have all the answers. Um, we've just got to really push it what we can. And to link back to the compact, this is a, a great way to do that because you, you're going to learn a lot from what other people are doing and how they're uh, implementing their strategies and, and trying to see if there's some levers we can pull together to kind of speed all this stuff up. Um, so yeah, a lot there. I hope that answered some of your questions there, sir. I think just a postscript. We did have the debate when we were thinking about compact and the best way to get the maximum impact. It was never about a stick. It was never about naming and shaming because all of us genuinely believed. And I think it's been borne out by the action that's been taken. It's much better to work together than go, see you. <laughs> You're never gonna achieve things by naming and shaming people in the same way that saying, actually, let's crowd people in and let's see if we can make a difference together. Personally, that's the way I've always conducted my career. And I think there's a lot of people around the compact table that feel the same way. There's a lady who's been... Um, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Bridie Ashrone, and, and I'm with Edinburgh Voluntary Organisations Council, which is one of three organisations that supports the community and voluntary sector in the city. So we work with Edinburgh Social Enterprise and with Volunteer Edinburgh. And I just want to say how welcome the compact has been because it's where we'd like to get to with helping charities and, and volunteering led organizations in the city. So you've, um, you know, you've trailblazed for us. Yes, you are bigger, um, but on the other hand, that will allow real, um, uh, you know, substantial impact. What I want to mention to people is that we've actually got local forum here in Edinburgh for the citizen as well and for small organisations to get involved. Because I think sometimes people feel really, oh God, you know, what's my opportunity to engage in this? How can I really make a difference? Um, so that's where we hope the two things can begin to join, for the, from things like the compact to the local. And over the next couple of months, we're doing a few local design events where people can come in and help design what they think might work in their communities. And I think with that, hopefully there's an opportunity to work with the Chamber of Commerce um, and together, Chamber of Commerce and ourselves have been funded to do a collaborative piece of work which can bring business and communities and citizens together with their ideas. We ran our first one in New Haven last week and it was really, it was actually quite a challenging event as well because people for whom climate didn't see, doesn't seem like a priority, they felt there are other priorities or even is it, is it, was it real? But equally we had people in the room really coming together with a sense of optimism. Um, so we've got a few more of those happening this year through EVOC. Um, and we'd just love people to come along. So the Chamber of Commerce are going to help us promote these. But I think the opportunity to keep the pound in Edinburgh to actually that our bigger businesses like the Compact can actually spend money with their SMEs and then those SMEs and local community organisations keep pounds in Edinburgh too to local businesses that do some of this and skill people up in some of our communities on the edge with high poverty, some of the top poverty in Scotland. We've got one in um, some of the uh, you know top 10 poverty areas in Scotland on the edge but of the city. But what if those folk there could actually get the skills to be part of the green revolution? Mm -hmm. We could have really quite an innovative approach uh, if we connect the dots across that. And I just want to say thank you to, to everybody, to, but particularly uh, 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 the panel tonight, because yeah, th this is the, we're in the foothills of something really significant. And I'd like to just advocate to get involved in your community. What's around the corner? But, yeah. 
everyone, I'm, I'm conscious that we've run over time and I apologise for that. So I think with that, I'm going to draw proceedings to a close. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us. I hope we've done something to convince you of the merits of the Edinburgh Climate Compact. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Claire, and I'd like to say thank you to Anita, Aaron and Jamie for your fascinating insights on climate action. Here at the EICC, it is our mission to create an environment which inspires ideas that change the world, and I'm sure tonight the talks will inspire you all. Within the international conference industry, we talk a lot about legacy and impact of international conferences. And if any of you here have been inspired tonight for your business or to go back and speak to your employers about signing up to the Edinburgh Climate Compact, I would see that as a legacy of the group of us here meeting tonight. Um, as I mentioned earlier this evening, we have been filming tonight, so if you'd like to watch any of it back and share with your colleagues, friends and family to help spread the message for a more sustainable future for all, it will be available uh, for free on our YouTube channel, EICC Venue. And to stay up to date with any future EICC live events, please keep an eye on the EICC website, What's On page. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter or by following us on Twitter at EICC. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for coming out tonight on a very cold and dark evening. The EICC Live will be back in a few months with something completely different, so stay tuned for that. Have a great evening and thank you very much.